Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Ignite Lab Coats and Beyond speaker series. With us today is Dr. Paul Zalzal. Dr. Zalzal is an orthopedic surgeon and runs his clinical practice out of the Oakville Trafalgar Memorial Hospital, where he is the chair of the Research Ethics Committee. He has been performing adult reconstructive and ambulatory trauma surgery for over 15 years. He has pioneered computer-assisted surgical techniques in these areas. He is also an associate clinical professor at McMaster University and has a Master's of Applied Sciences in Biomedical Engineering. His list of publications include topics relevant to clinical outcomes, biomechanics, tissue engineering, and computer-assisted surgery. He has been employed as a consultant to several biotech companies and has been an active member of design teams producing successful commercial products in fields of computer-assisted surgery. He is also regularly involved in medical legal consultations, and to top it all off, he is the co-founder of the YouTube channel Talking With Docs that has over 3.5 million views. And so, without further ado, let's jump into the seminar. I'd like to give a warm welcome to Dr. Paul Zalzel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Honored to be here, Danny and Bianca, and thank you so much for asking me to talk. I just want to say before I start how impressed I am with Ignite. Um, I think never in my lifetime have I ever seen a time in the world where science is so important and the general public is really looking at scientists. We're not nerds anymore. <laughs> we finally made it to the mainstream. Um, you know, people are listening general public I think uh, because you know the science is what's saving lives right now so uh, your organization fostering research at early stages really is uh, fascinating and it really is timely right now so thank you for that and thank you for the invitation it's a pleasure to have you join us tonight um, and thank you for your kind words we're very excited with ignite and bringing this all to people and continuing that mission um, so to start us off, um, can you give us like, I know I gave like a very short, quick interview of all your achievements and current positions, uh, but if you can give us kind of like an overview of your journey, how you got to where you are today. Okay, sure. So um, I guess the only two parts missing from what you described I was doing was father and husband. That's in there too, <laughs> most important of all the stuff. But um, my journey, you know, I, I studied engineering at, at University of Toronto, uh, mechanical engineering, um, and then I did a master's in um, biomedical engineering, um, and then I went on to do medical school at McMaster University, uh, and then a residency in orthopedic surgery at McMaster University, and then I did a subspecialty training, uh, fellowships back at the University of Toronto at Mount Sinai Hospital and then um, landed where I am now. Awesome, perfect. Um, can you kind of expand a little bit on why you chose to move from research to medicine and how you still kept that passion for research alive while doing medicine? That's a, that's a good question. So, um, I, I mean, ever since I was uh, a young age, I, was all, I don't know if you guys remember the show, The Six Million Dollar Man, that's probably before your time, but it was about this guy who was in like a crash, rocket crash, and lost an arm and two legs, and they rebuilt him with, with prosthetic parts that ended up being way better than his original parts. Made a whole TV series out of it. So I always loved that man-machine um, combination. Uh, and so, you know, I studied engineering, and I always thought one day I'll do medicine. And to be honest, after engineering, I filled out, the application for medicine and then never gave it in because the opportunity to do my master's came up. So I did a year of my master's. I said, now I'm going to do it. So I filled out the application for medicine, never gave it in. And I said, I'll just finish my master's. I had the good fortune of some NSERC scholarships. Um, and then I, I love doing research, but I really missed the, the interaction with people. Uh, that was a big thing for me. So research, I did a lot in the lab, but I really enjoyed the interaction with people. So then finally, after my master's, I filled out that application and gave it in. 
and that's when I ended up sort of making the switch and going into medicine, uh, always knowing that I could try and do research along with it. Um, yeah, I think that's something that we all can really relate to. A lot of people are tr trying to juggle, do I want research, do I want medicine? I'm mean, really hearing from someone that's been through that path that is um, really impactful and can give us some insight on that too. Uh, can you expand a little bit about, um, I know some of the projects you're involved in right now is computer-assisted surgery. Can you expand on what that looks like in your day-to-day -day life in um, combination with your clinical work as well? Sure. Uh, um, and just before I get into that, on the topic, you mentioned, you know, medicine and research. I, I remember my a med school interview. I was at, at Western University of Western Ontario in London. And I was in the interview and the, and the guy said, why do you want to do medicine? You know, I see you've done a lot of research. I said, well, I want to do med clinical work and research work. This was a very intimidating senior physician. And he looked at me and said, it's impossible. You can't do it. You can only do one or the other. I was like, oh, and I was so discouraged. I took that as the law. I thought, that's it. I've got to pick one or the other. This is horrible. Luckily, he was wrong, and um, I didn't go to London for med school. But uh, So I continued doing research. And, yeah, computer-assisted surgery. Um, I, when I was doing a lot of uh, surgery, uh, I, I was finding that, we, you know, I, the way we would replace a body part was with uh, less precision then we would, you know, design a car part. It was amazing to me that, you know, stuff so important as a prosthetic being implanted into a person, a lot of the, the cuts and the way to implant it was eyeball, if you can believe it. You're kind of looking at it, that looks straight, that looks crooked. And, I, and being an engineer, I was shocked. Uh, so I started exploring computer-assisted surgery. It's called a navigation, they call it. And... Um, the first place I went in the, near the end of my residency to visit it, where they were, they were very advanced, and this was Queen's University, actually. I went to visit there. And they had developed their own in-house computer-assisted uh, surgery platform. And I just became fascinated. And then as companies started developing these computer-assisted uh, products, uh, I took them on. You know, I embraced them like 15, 10 years ago, a little bit more than maybe 15 years ago. And I thought, you know, I've got to track this, do research in this so that this can become the new norm on how to do certain surgical procedures. Awesome. Um, yeah, I, I want to touch on a point that you talked about there um, in your interview where they said that it's not possible. How did you make it possible? How did you make it work for you? Well, after crying for a few days, because that was my whole life plan, <laughs> um, I thought, I looked around and I saw who, who is doing you know, research and medicine at the same time. And, and, you know, back then it was certainly less common. People usually chose a path. Um, but I think what I realized is you, you can't do it alone. Like you can't do the whole project alone, solve the problem, answer the question by yourself. It becomes a team. It becomes a multidisciplinary team. And so I joined different groups that were doing projects uh you know and that's how i found i could have a significant role right and that way you have people with different strengths backgrounds and i found those multidisciplinary teams really enabled uh how to answer research questions effectively awesome yeah i think that's something that our generation is also learning too is like working together as a team it's no longer just a one-man show um, and we're working together and figuring out how, out how to bring that um, idea to the front and make it realistic. Um, and so to continue on that, can you tell us a little about some mentors that have been some, someone that you've looked up to or guided you in your process so that we kind of know where we can go and look for some of those mentors as well? Sure. Um, well, before medicine, I, you know, the, I worked at, it used to be in the Roseburg building, the New York University of Toronto was the Institute of Biomedical Engineering. And they took people from different, um, you know, types of engineering and science to come in and, and work on projects. And so my mentors there were, uh, one, his name was Ross Ethier. He was a, just like, you can imagine this guy was like a boy genius when he was a kid. And uh, he just, his, his research was very focused to the point, he did a lot of research on the eye and glaucoma. And he had a very uh, efficient research method. So I was very influenced uh, by that. And then uh, throughout my 
my training, when I got the next real mentor I, I found was uh, my fellowship supervisor at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital and University of Toronto. His name was Dr. Alan Gross. And he was like, uh, you know, world renowned. Any orthopedic surgeon in the world knows who Dr. Alan Gross is. And I always thought he was going to be just an untouchable, unapproachable guy, and I'd be lucky if some knowledge spilled out of his ear and I could pick it up. Uh, but it turned out he was a, a fascinating guy, and he was just the nicest man. His patients absolutely loved him, and he, he had a great sense of humor. He remains to this day my mentor. Yeah, I think that's something that we don't necessarily learn in school that that's some, something that can help you in your path and really guide you in your direction. And so it's really nice to hear from other people on where they found their mentors and what guided them so that we can learn from that um, and know where we can go and find some of those mentors as well. And it's important to, if you have a mentor, you can learn from them like uh, directly and indirectly. Um, you can you learn you know you learn from them and you you might see the way they do something or the way they live their life and you might say you know I, I love this person I'm learning so much I might do this a little different and and here's why because I've seen you know what's happened when he goes down that path personal life and lifestyle is really important to me too and and I right from the beginning of medicine because I remember when I started my surgical rotation I opened the the, the first textbook surgical test textbook I had. It was actually a paperback. I opened it, and on the first page, the first chapter was the OR, the operating room. And it said, the operating room, home of the surgeon. I like closed the book, put it down, leaned back, and like almost burst into tears. I'm like, that's not my home, and I don't want that to be my home. Have I made the right decision? And then that was, you know, that, that was really scaring me, and that fear was reinforced. You guys ever watch the show ER? Do you remember the show ER? That might be before your time. ER was about, you know, just medicine in an emergency room. And the, one of the main characters, was named, his name was Carter. And he was in a surgical program. And then halfway through season two or something, he switched out of a surgical program and went into a medical program instead of staying in surgery. And I'm like, oh, my God. The one book says Home of the Surgeon. My favorite character on TV just left surgery. What have I done? So I knew from an early age that if I'm going to do this, i got to keep a lifestyle that I can manage. So he was my mentor for professional life, but not personal side of things. You touched on a very important point there of keeping a balance. Um, and that's something that I know myself struggle with sometimes, keeping that balance and um, making time for other things other than school and extracurriculars and getting to med or getting to grad school, whatever it might be. Um, how do you manage to keep that balance? Like what things you implement or um, remind yourself of to keep that balance? Yeah, it's tough. I, I know, you know, I've, I've been where you guys are, and I know your ba your ba you've got balance. The balance is here. School, work, the rest of the world. That's my balance. My balance is school right now. Get out of my face. This is my balance. <laughs> and that's fine, right? It's sustainable for a few years, as long as you give yourself some breaks, right? I always, mine was always work hard, play hard. Always going through university was work hard, play hard. Because you, you got to have both, or you you won't be able to, you won't get through it. You won't get to the other side in one piece, right? Uh, you can't just get through playing hard and you can't just get through it working hard. Uh, but then later on, it becomes very difficult. Um, and you've got you've to trust the people around you and look, look at the people around you and, and take their feedback. And they'll tell you, that they'll say, you, you're working too hard and you might not see it. And then, you know, then you sort of back off and, uh, and re reassess, readjust, maybe one or two projects you can't take take on. And one of my closest friends, Dr. Bischoff, he's an orthopedic surgeon with Milton. And, you know, he if he if we saw each other working too hard, we'd keep each other in check. And he said to me, he goes, there's never, ever been a surgeon on his deathbed that said, I should have worked harder. I should have spent more time at the hospital. I should have poured more into my work. Never in the history of medicine has there been a man or a woman say that on their deathbed. So that really, I always remember that. You know what? You're always going to regret not, you know, spending your lifestyle time as opposed to your work time. So it's a constant struggle, but you've got to 
you got to get that in check. Not, I know not right now where you guys are at, maybe not, but down the road you have to. Sound exactly like my parents. They constantly <laughs> tell me the same thing, work hard, play hard. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely some things that we should take into consideration where we work on. I know myself especially. Um, I want to jump into a little bit more specifics about kind of your career path. Um, and so is there some things that you didn't expect, that were unexpected, either good or bad, that came with your journey? And how do you kind of handle those? Yeah, I think um, residency became a little bit unexpected. I mean, I heard that it was, like I always say, I love engineering. I love medicine. I made a lot of friends, you know, worked hard, enjoyed it. And then I got to residency, and at, like now, even to this day, I tell people I would not repeat one day of it for a million dollars. If someone said, I've got a time machine, you can go back, and I'll give you a million dollars to go back and just do one day. You can choose which day in your five year residency. Which one would you do? I'd say, None. Keep your million dollars, and I'll give you another 50 bucks to get out of here. So that was a bit of a surprise. It was a bit of a surprise what, what, you could you you could you could put yourself through. It's gotten better in the last twenty five years for sure, but it's still not a walk in the park. Um, that was one surprise. The other surprise was um, was this the, the battle with uh, administration? You know what I mean? Uh, as a physician, you're always sort of battling administration, and they've got their um, competing interests to yours, which are trying to take care of the patients. Um, and doing your research. Uh, so those are kind of shockers. Um, and then I think some pleasant surprises were the same. Like, re I could get through, you know, I could get through residency. I could, you know, I could stay up for a whole weekend and then Monday go to work. You know, it's doable. Um, I don't remember much of that, but <laughs> it's doable. Um, and, you know, and then the other thing is just how, 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 good it makes you feel um like i thought i always knew i wanted to help people and, and you know that's why partly why i went to medicine but just how good you feel when you get a thank you card uh from someone and it just really you know that was a pleasant uh surprise for me i never realized it would really touch me in that way uh, conversely i never realized how much it would hurt if someone wasn't happy with your services it really is hard not to take that personally because it is so personal uh, but those are some surprises how vested you get into it yeah, those are definitely some things that you hear about too and i i can just assume that going through them is a whole different story and actually like feeling those um it's a whole different than hearing residency is not or hearing how invested you can get into your job um i think this plays a little bit into the same question um but what are some of the challenges that you have to face to get to where you are? I know you said residency was hard, uh, but was there other kind of minor setbacks or challenges that you have to overcome to reach your position where you are today? Um, well, yeah, I mean, the, cha the challenge of getting into medical school, that's the most imminent one that anyone interested now is, is facing, and then you guys are facing that. And that's huge. That's a big challenge. Don't underestimate that. If you're feeling stressed and freaking out, that's normal. That's a normal response to how stressful it is to try and get into medical school. Um, so that, that's the most obvious big challenge, right? Um, and then and then inside it, you know, that, that challenge, that, you know, once you're in medicine, then you've got to decide. Like, medicine is, um, is almost like business. Like if you say, I'm going to study business, there's no two people that have the same job, like everyone's got a different, it doesn't mean exactly what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. There's so many different choices in business, right? Medicine's not that much, but you could say I studied medicine, but then your jobs can be so different, like a surgeon versus a psychiatrist versus a pathologist versus a public health official versus, uh, you know, a leader in a, in a company, a medical, medical lead in a company, like it's so vast. And it's such a short time, you have to decide early, what am I going to do? Like, what, I haven't tried all the different things. How am I going to pick what program I want to do? So that that's a big challenge. That, that challenge within yourself to figure out what kind of medicine you want to practice. Seems weird to say that when you're just trying to get into medical school. But believe me, before you know it, 
you're like, holy cow, I have to decide what I want to do for the rest of my life. So that, that was a challenge. And then, like I said, residency, for me, the surgical residencies I found challenging. They, they were tough. Uh, I mean, I remember once I was working like, uh, you know, an all-nighter, of course, you're on call, you work the next day, and then I drove home late at night, and then I got home, and then the next morning I'm driving in super early, and the phone rings, and I'm like, hello, oh, and, and the guy's like, hi, this is the officer something. I'm like, oh, you know, it's probably one of the trauma patients last night. So he goes, he goes uh, I said, can I help you? Officer says, yeah, um, do you know you were involved in a drive-away fill-up? I'm like, that sounds so much like a drive-by shooting. He's like, no, no, drive-away fill-up. You drove, you went to the Shell station, you filled your car up with gas, then you drove away without paying. I'm like, I, I'm so sorry. I had to drive back and pay this poor guy. And the guy's looking and goes, you drove away. I waited and waited and you never came back to pay. And I was like, I was just out of it, right? That's mentally, I, I went on to drive to work and drove through the arm at the parking garage to get into rounds because a few minutes late. And I'm like, this is a bad day. And it was, and it was just like, I probably had one of those bad days a week. So it, that was a huge challenge. Um, you know, and then you're done, you finish your residency, you've done your fellowships, and you're like, thank God, I'm, I'm all done with my decisions. Then you got to decide, well, where do you want to work? Do you want to work in the community? Do you want to work in a hospital? Do you want to be in an academic center? Do you want to stay in the, in the GTA? Do you want to go up north? Do you want to do rural work? So then you got more decisions. And so those are the, the things, those, those challenges that you, they're within yourself, but you got to get over them. So those do sound like some good challenges that I think we all will face our own version of those challenges too. Um, something I want to check back on too is kind of what you were talking about making that decision on which field of medicine you want to go into. And that goes for like any like research field as well. Um, what, did, what steps did you take to kind of figure out which area you enjoyed or wanted to pursue? Well, for, for me, I knew I loved, you know, engineering, physics, uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I had to find a field that had that in, right? Um, I, I love the interaction with people too, uh, but I knew I had to have that. So I looked at things like cardiology because, you know, the heart is a pump and my master's was a lot of fluid mechanics. I thought, oh, that's pretty good. Well, you know, the musculoskeletal stuff I liked because of my mechanical engineering background. And then you got to kind of decide, do I want to be like in, in the medicine field? Uh, where it's you know where it's a lot of diagnosis and treatment medically, or do I want to be in the surgical field where I'm procedure based practice, heavy duty procedure based practice? That's two different worlds, right? And so I I had to I had to you know decide. And for me, I had to sort of align with what I thought was was best for my personality. That and that good friend of mine, Dr. Bischoff, put his arm around me and said, hey, let's do orthopedics together. It'll be fun. <laughs> that was the biggest lie he ever told me. But we did go through residency together, and I'm glad I'm glad with what I chose. I can't see myself doing any other medicine right now. But. So that, that's really good um, to hear, too, and to know that you kind of just have to trust your gut with it and see where your personality fits in that um, and try different areas, I guess, and see what works best. Um, can you expand a little bit? I know we touched on this in the beginning, but um, can you expand a little bit about how your involvement in research changed from your master's to now and what that kind of looks like on a day-to-day -day or weekly basis? Sure. So in my master's, you know, like you guys, I was in the lab all day, right? Um, I loved it. It was fun because it was, it was a slower pace than undergrad. It wasn't the same grind. Uh, but like I said, I missed that personal interaction. So I was in the lab running experiments, writing them up, um, trying to publish and, and that. Um, and then in, in medicine, uh, it sort of, I then got more into the team approach of things in, in medicine. And the questions uh, that you're addressing, that I started addressing, were more, um, more clinical, not more clinical based, but they had a quicker um, adaptability to real life situations. The first paper I ever published uh, was uh, in, in residency uh, was um, a uh, um, fractures at the that occur in the bone at the end of a long stem for a hip replacement. 
there were these fractures that were occurring 16, 17% of the time, little cracks in the bone that the surgeon didn't even know about, and we can see them on x-ray after. So that was, you know, that was one of those things where I could, I studied a lot of fracture mechanics and mechanical engineering, and I, you know, was in, intrigued with hip replacement, and that was something that sort of tied it all together. So that was sort of, you know, now I've got a research that has a re application to a person's body right away, whereas my master's was more looking at turbulent flow, laminar flow, and, and, and blood flow, and it was like, you know, 50 steps away from ever helping someone clinically, uh, whereas this brought it closer to a clinical sort of application. Uh, yeah, I think what we've heard from other physician scientists and people that are so involved with research while they're doing um, their doctor work is that your research kind of shifts in a way to be more clinical and more direct. Um, in the involvement it has in people. Um, so to kind of follow on kind of what, like the schedule of things, um, can you just give us like an overview of what your week looks like? Um, what you, things that you're involved in, how you schedule things, how you manage your priorities? Um, just walk us through some of that. Sure. Um, so typically, uh, let's say it starts on a Monday. Monday morning is a fracture clinic. So I start that at seven in the morning, um, and that's where you're seeing stuff in the hospital. And patients I see there are like post-operative patients uh, that I've operated on uh, for follow-up, or trauma patients, stuff that's coming through the emergency room, people with broken, you know, wrists, ankles, uh, hips, all that kind of stuff. They come in through the fracture clinic, um, and so that runs for the half day. Uh, and then I, my afternoon is. Usually, um, I do medical legal assessment. So that's where lawyers will ask me my opinion on injuries. Uh, was this caused by this? Was this caused by that? Do you think this person's you know life is ruined? Do you think they're going to be able to work again? Those kind of medical legal consultations. Uh, and if I don't do that, it's a bit of research work. And then um, you know, and then the evenings is usually family time. Uh, you know, either helping a child who I won't name with physics in university or um, helping. I remember one day I was, I was doing, you know, like uh, bed mass and, um, you know, equations of motion in the same half hour. Well, my brain's doing some trampoline work here. Um, and so a lot of family time in the evenings. Tuesday uh, is OR day in the morning. And that we call it Tricky Tuesday. That's where I'll do it with another surgeon where we have a difficult case um, that we often do together. Uh, and then Tuesday afternoon is an office where I see consults. So other family docs will say, hey, can you see this person about their hip arthritis or about their knee arthritis? That's the same thing I do on Wednesday. Thursday, I'm back in the OR uh, I'm doing cases. And then Friday's a flex day, either in the OR or I'm doing my research project or I'm doing um, uh, catch-up paperwork, that kind of stuff. But that's that's sort of the weekend and the evenings, family time, weekends, family time, family events, and things like that. And of course, if you're working on something that spills into some of that time, that you know ends up getting done a bit on the weekend or the evenings. And then we have to do call. Whenever a surgeon has a relationship with a hospital, we have we, we operate in the hospital, so we need that relationship. Uh, in exchange for the OR time, the hospital says, okay, well, you have to cover emergencies for us. So your team splits it up and you're on call once every four nights, once every five nights, one weekend a month or whatever. And that's where you're just available for the emergency room to call you if they have an emergency, you know, in your field. Uh, and you're, you could be there all night, you could be up all night, you could be operating in the evening uh, or whatever, but you have to be available on call, it's called. Uh, that's pretty much what, what most of my weeks uh, look like. Great. Um, I want to track back on something that you mentioned on the medical legal work that you're doing. Um, that's something that we haven't touched on yet. And so um, can you just kind of elaborate on that? Why you got involved in it? What it entails? Sure. sure. Um, so medical legal work is it's the kind of stuff that most physicians don't love doing, you know, because docs and lawyers, you know, they don't go out for beers together often, you know what I mean? Um, but it is an important uh, job because the lawyers need 
our help to give them the evidence they need to defend their claims and help the people that they're helping in their in their own way. So it is it is tough work. It, it's lucrative financially. It pays very well because it's outside of that government fund. It's more into the private fund, private purse. So it pays more more than the, the OHIP sort of stuff does. So that's a draw. Uh, and I have some relationships with some lawyers that I really like and, and you know we get along very well. And so I like to help them out when I can. So that's sort of medical medical legal work. You see a, a client, they're not patients anymore now, they're a client, either they're a defendant or a plaintiff. You examine them and then you produce a report and that becomes evidence for the lawyer to use. And then if required, you'll be called in as an expert witness uh, you know, in a trial, if the thing goes to trial. Interesting. Um, is this something that all physicians do, or is no. it something you choose to do? You choose to do. Yeah, not okay. all do it. You choose to do it. Okay. Yeah. And I've been why... doing it probably for 15 years. <laughs> That's been a, so pretty much from yeah. the beginning of your yeah. surgeon pathway. Yeah. That's cool. Um, I think that was it for uh, kind of your your journey, your path. Um, and so before we hand it over to the students to let them ask you some questions, I want to leave with a final question. Um, what advice can you give myself, all the other students in this call, everyone else is going to see this video that's at high school or university and want to pursue a path like yours? Okay. Well, I think, I think the first thing you got, you have to do is try and figure out how to like it <laughs> you know if you're not loving what you're doing and, and i mean there's courses they just don't love you know what i mean i remember i took i took some my electives i had a heavy duty science you know in engineering but i took my electives were in the english department i took english lit and uh, canadian literature just to get something different so try and keep doing stuff you like in school and um like if you're if you're in high school there's no one path to get into medicine, you know what I mean. Um, the smartest woman in my, smartest person was a woman in my med school class, Martha Fulford. You might have read some of her stuff. She's she's an infectious disease specialist. Um, she she came in from the arts. I'm pretty sure she didn't have a science background. She came to med school from the arts, and she was brilliant. So there's no one pathway. Try and find something you like doing in university, like studying. Do that. And look at the criteria for the med school you want to get into and, and incorporate that into it. So try and enjoy it, right? Because you do it so much and so long, you got to try and figure out how to like it. That'd be my, my, my biggest advice. Because if, if you can figure out how to like it, you'll be, you'll be good at it. And you might like it just because you like who you're living with and you, and you enjoy that atmosphere. Or you like the, the atmosphere in the universe. Get to like where you're at and be, be happy doing it. And then you, that'll make it easier to be successful. Um, that's probably my biggest advice. Thank you. Um, that's definitely something that my parents tell me all the time too, and something that I try to apply because I know if I do something that I really like, I'm probably going to do better at it too, and yeah. um, it won't be a chore to get up and do it. Um, so yeah, yeah, that definitely is advice I'd like to live by too. It's easy to say, but it's hard to like organic chemistry. Is there anyone on the planet that enjoyed that course? Like uh, I did. But, I mean, I, I don't love think it so much. <laughs> See, there you go. So you find what you like. There's something yes. for everyone. For sure. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. And more importantly, thank you for Dr. Zalza for joining us and giving us some insight into your career path and your journey. Um, we really appreciate your insight into these things and advice that you're giving us throughout. I know I definitely learned a lot. And I hope everyone else did as well. Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I enjoyed it. I hope in some way, I've, if I've helped one of you in one little way, then that'll make me feel good. I'm definitely sure you did. Um, perfect. Alrighty. Thank you.